the archive is mysteriously, it stops after 1902, um, which as a novelist, you know, you can make a reason for, which I do. But it did occur to me um, that these letters might have been the actual ones that she read to Morrison from, which um, on the occasion of a, of a nosebleed, he would get nosebleeds when he was rather tense. Um, she did read, she read these letters to uh, a Morrison who was astounded, outraged, and obviously quite titillated by them. Among these letters, among the ones that I've read, and I have photocopies of, are missives from the Tennessee <coughs> congressman John Wes- Wesley Gaines, who she was completely <coughs> mad at, and Maida helped me find a photograph of, of Gaines, and he is hot. <laughs> um, there were letters from her three times fiancé, George Bew, from Willie Vanderbilt Jr., from cadets at the Tamil Payne Military Academy, and from a young man running a mine in South America who liked to think of her while laying in his hammock. She kissed, and she told, a number of her admirers plainly knew quite a lot about the others. Poor George, one remarked about her fiancé, his dough is cake. <laughs> Indeed, there's nothing, there was nothing half-baked about Miss May Ruth Perkins' sex life. We'll return to May and her relationship with Morrison in a little bit. But Morrison and May were not the only characters in A Most Immoral Woman drawn from real life. There's the great war correspondent, Lionel James, for example. James has quite a big presence in the novel, thanks to a visionary scheme that he came up with for revolutionizing war correspondence, a scheme which required Morrison's help and conveniently gave him an excuse to pursue Fair May all the way to Japan at a very convenient time for him to do so. I, I realized that this, this you know, ready-made plot twist was there only after my research into the Russo-Japanese War, um, which he had boosted and, and, and helped to start in a way, uh, led me to stumble across Peter Slattery's engrossing book reporting the Russo-Japanese War, 1904-5, to Lionel James's first wireless transmissions to the Times big title. This book was published just around the time I was starting work on the project and Lionel James just leapt off the page and said I have to be in your novel. Um, he's, he's quite an irascible, interesting, visionary, dedicated, obsessive visionary. He was obs- as obsessive about wireless telegraphy and its potential for war correspondence as Morrison was obsessive about May. That was quite nice. Um, other real life figures in A Most Immoral Women Um, Another one is the pioneering female war correspondent, Eleanor Franklin, um, and the American novelist, Jack London, who covered the Russo-Japanese War for Hearst's newspapers, as well as London's friend, the American reporter, Martin Egan, who was Morrison's chief rival for May's attention. You may remember that he had May for days on end, according to Morrison. I was tipped off to Egan's friendship with London when a Google search on Egan led me to a short bio of London, The bio mentioned that London had been so fond of Egan that with whom he'd swapped stories and armed wrestled in bars up and down the west coast of America that he wanted to name, oddly enough, London wanted to name his 1909 semi-autobiographical novel Martin Egan, but Egan objected and so London called it Martin Eden instead. And I highly recommend it, it's very good fun. Then there's Sir Robert Hart of the Chinese Customs Service, uh, Hart's niece, the the writer Juliet Breddon, uh, Juliet's mother, the scandalous Lady Breddon, Lady Breddon's husband, Lord Breddon, whom Morrison found tedious and was very pleased with being cuckolded, for there's also her lover, Bertie Lennox Simpson, whom Morrison found appalling. Um, And a host of other people, um, uh, including, of course, Captain Tremaine Smith, of the steamliner Siberia, had Morrison not recorded in his journal that Captain Smith had kissed May all the way from Honolulu to Yokohama, Captain Tremaine Smith may never have gone down, so to speak, in history at all. (laughs) In researching the minor characters, I made a few interesting discoveries. Take the identity of the woman biographers identify with ill-concealed amusement as May's chaperone, Mrs. Ragsdale. Reading the journals carefully, it became evident that Mrs. Ragsdale was not a woman, a chaperone, traveling with May um, from the United States, but her hostess in Tianjin, and that there was a Mr. Ragsdale. 
James Ragsdale, as it turns out, was the unofficial American consul in Tianjin. Histories and memoirs of the siege of Peking reveal him to be the author of a letter which greatly irritated the besieged, for he told them in it that he had a dream in which they'd all died. <laughs> Digging a little deeper, I found that James Ragsdale was a man with a past. Previous to arriving in China, he had been, among other things, senior proprietor of the Sonoma County Abstract Bureau and the publisher of the Daily Republican. Now, um, as postmaster for Santa Rosa, he'd introduced the practice of couriers delivering the mail to people. And uh, the citizens of Santa Rosa sang his praises for that. Um, his stocks rose even further when it became known that he'd been with Sherman on his famous March to the Sea and had fought in some of the severest engagements in the Civil War. Uh, the Republican Party even invited him to run for office. But was all that true? The Democrats did a little digging into Ragsdale's past, and in their own newspaper, they alleged that he had arrived in California only after fleeing the fury of debtors in Iowa and half a dozen states, other states. They called him, quote, an ignoramus of infamous character, an object of pity as well as contempt, an adventurer, absconder, and a scoundrel. Now, they were Democrats, he was a Republican, but who knows, I'm going with it. Um, I wondered if he had not gotten into some fresh trouble in California and needed to get out of that state as well, because it's more than conceivable that it was his Republican connections that helped to organize his posting in Tianjin. But there's a delicious irony in this, because it's an absolute fact. I've read this in his own paper. He was active in the late 19th century movement in California against Chinese immigration. He was not only a member of the infamous anti-Cooley clubs, but he went so far as to declare through his newspaper that the Chinese were, quote, most wicked and inhuman, without conscience, mercy, or human feeling. They are monsters in human form, cunning and educated, therefore more dangerous and vile. How excited he must have been to learn that the path out of trouble led to China. <laughs> Whether or not George Clement Perkins helped to get Ragsdale, his post in Tianjin, in reality, and it's likely that the two would have been at least acquainted, it makes sense that Perkins would have turned to a fellow Republican and one who perhaps owed him a favor to look after his daughter on her own sojourn to the East. I could find little about Mrs. Ragsdale, incidentally, other than that her name was Effie. But what is frustrating for the historian is great for the novelist. She was a blank page. I summoned her up from what I understood of the context in which she lived, from that of her marriage, and to that of the context of the foreign community of Tianjin, and then I had a bit of fun. Um, in order to have fun, I changed the names of some of the other minor characters, just to give myself a bit more fictional latitude. So the British military attaché, Charles Merriweather Ducat, who indeed accompanied Morrison on that trip when he met Maisie at the Great Wall, um, becomes Charles Merriweather Dumas. Chester Holcomb, the American diplomat, and this way I go the other way, there's a, uh, a, a fellow called Chester Holcomb who was an American diplomat and the author of a book called The Real Chinaman. Um, I suspect he was the C.R. Holcomb, who Morrison says had made four times in two hours. I don't know. But I just turned him into Chester Holdsworth um, so that I could have more fun. Morrison's got a journalistic nemesis called Greener. I make him Granger, so again, it can be a bit more amusing. Morrison's Shanghai colleague, J.O.P. Bland, you might have, some of you might have tweaked to that, becomes uh, the basis for J.O.P. Blunt mainly because I wanted to give Morrison a few more scenes with him and also conversations with his wife. And Morrison didn't have a high regard for the actual J.O.P. Bland's wife, but I wanted him to be friends with this woman. Um, but whatever I did in the way of fictionalizing actual people or events, I did want to remain within the outlines of the possible and the reasonable. I changed a bit of chronology. I gave Morrison and May a bit more time together in a block in Shanghai when, in fact, they were up and down the coast constantly meeting on boats and meeting in ports and all of this sort of thing at a dizzying rate. My editor had been looking at one of my drafts and she said, I'm sp I was spending so much time getting my characters on and off boats and trains that there, were, there really was hardly any chance for them to have a proper conversation, much, much less an hour or two in bed. So she said, why don't you just put them in Shanghai for a little while? 
Um, so I, I, yeah, I went, yes, okay, I can do that. I would never have put them in Paris. Um, these are the sort of liberties I felt I could take. I created an account, encounters between Morrison and Jack London, between Morrison and Eleanor Franklin, where I have no evidence that those occurred. But the thing is, both of them were, were covering the Russo-Japanese War. He was in Tokyo. He was meeting this correspondence. And London actually uh, did get lift on Lionel James's press boat, as I learned from Slattery's book. So I'm just making these connections and having, having, having a bit of fun with them, um, that it is conceivable that he would have run into them. Whatever I did, however, I never consciously depicted any of the historical figures um, in a way that contradicted my understanding, flawed as, a, as it might be, of their individual spirits or personalities or beliefs. And I explicitly promised as much with regard to Morrison in an undertaking to the Mitchell Library, um, which controls the rights to his papers. And in exchange, they granted me permission to freely quote and paraphrase uh, from his letters and journals in and out of context, um, in thoughts and conversations and, and, and so on. Um, I had to understand a lot of different things to write this book, which I only had a a very passing knowledge of before, and one of them is the position of women around the turn of the century, uh, in particular in the United States. I wanted to understand May's context. Um, the U.S. was booming with industry, booming with confidence. Things were happening. Women were entering the workforce, and yet not only were women in California not entitled to vote at that time, they didn't even have unfettered rights to own property in their own name. It's a bit hard to imagine. Um, and there were some notable female pioneers in the U.S. and England in professions ranging from medicine to law, higher education, and so on. Um, careers for women were quite controversial. Women for poor fa from poor families uh, were entering work in unprecedented numbers, and as a consequence, they were beginning to enjoy uh, a degree of freedom, financial independence and social freedom, which had never been the case ever before. Yet it was still assumed that a woman's proper place and a proper role in life was to be a good wife and mother. Um, girls who slept around, um, because of course you're supposed to be a virgin until marriage, girls who slept around risked being confined at this time in mental asylums if they were considered nymphomaniacs, man-crazy. They might even suffer a clitoral ex um, excision um, in these <coughs> mental asylums. Um, if the isolation in darkened rooms and vegetarian diet failed to dampen their dangerous libidos. Um, so it had to have been May's wealth and her family's social position which protected her from such a fate. Uh, the Victorian era in general was fabled for its era of sexual repression. Even the word milk was not supposed to be uttered aloud in polite company for its inevitable association with breasts. However, cream was considered perfectly fine. <laughs> Of course, bordellos flourished in the Victorian era gave us, in my opinion anyway, some of the finest erotica in the English language, including John Cleland's Fanny Hill, Memoirs of a Woman of Pleasure. My curiosity had been piqued by Morrison's note about May having been seduced by a Dr. Jack Fee in a, re in a restaurant in San Francisco known as the Hen and Chickens or Poultry or some such. So this is one of the... the I'll just give you an... Uh, one of these little things that I, I just went, what is this? And I had to know. How was one seduced, which almost certainly indicated her first time, in a restaurant? It was so bizarre. I puzzled over this. I tried to, I Googled, I, I looked at various things. I couldn't work it out. Then I went to San Francisco myself, and I picked up a number of local histories, including one of, a, one of the local wild girls of her time, Big Alma. Um, have everybody, have anybody been to San Francisco? Do you remember Union Square has that plinth? And on the plinth is a, um, is a statue. That statue, the model for that statue was Big Alma. Um, in the biography of Big Alma, there was, it reveals that there was this notorious restaurant known as Le Poulet. Hen and chicken, poultry. Le Poulet. The ground floor of Le Poulet resembled any other respectable eatery. The second floor had private rooms, and the third. The third boasted suites, lockable from the inside, complete with a bedroom, with a double bed, and full bathroom facilities, including shower and bidet. And if a little bit of a spell lunch um, in, the, uh, 
in the third floor wasn't enough. There was actually a lift that went down to the basement and then you could go through a little tunnel and check into the hotel next door. Very discreet. Once I knew that Le Poulet was named the Poodle Dog, Le Poulet French restaurant Poodle Dog, then Google began to yield. I even found a fellow in San Francisco, because Poodle Dog, San Francisco, yields a lot of information. There's a fellow in San Francisco, Glenn Cock, who, who collects Poodle Dog memorabilia, including photos and menus. And he shared all that with me over the internet, and he gets an acknowledgement. It was wonderful. Anyway, I'm sw- I was swimming with these details, not just about San Francisco's naughty restaurants, but I, I really went overboard with research. The depth of the entrance to Morrison's Wang Fujing Mansion and its significance, the types of birds found around Shinobazu Pond in Ueno Park, Tokyo, the sorts of prints that missionaries were likely to display in their parlors in China, the cocktails served at the British naval base um, off the coast of Shandong on Liu Gongdao the treatment of Jewish conscripts in the Tsar's army during the Russo-Japanese War, the complex politics of Japanese war censorship. My publisher at Fourth Estate, Linda Fennell, (laughs) noting that the book was already a year late, told me kindly but firmly to close the source books. (laughs) She reminded me that I was actually writing a novel. Um, As Henry James once wrote, it takes a great deal of history to produce a little literature. I had the great deal of history, so it was time to get on to the second bit, and it was time to crawl into bed with Morrison. When I do crawl into bed with him, it's 1904, Qing Dynasty's in decline, he's a, he's a bachelor, 42 years old, reasonable amount of, of assets, fairly querulous about his health, noting all of his ailments in his journal, his joints have become rheumatic, his digestion is troubled, and he worries over an induration in the left gnocchus, which mystified me until I realized it was a lump in his testicle. Um, he is, however, rather pleased for himself with himself for having started, uh, played a small role in starting the Russo-Japanese War. He's less happy with himself for having confided the concerns about his health to his editor, um, who, out of concern, or perhaps just wary of Morrison's partisanship, dispatched a whole lot of other correspondence to cover the war. Morrison's feeling underutilized and at loose ends. It's in these circumstances that he ends up on the last night of February 1904 in Shanghai, Guam. And that night, he encounters Maisie. They climb the Great Wall, and then, as he writes in his diary, we then sat down on the crest, and there was disclosed to me what I had never experienced before, a revelation that astounded me. Now... (laughs) I'm not normally short of chutzpah, um, but trying to work out exactly what that revelation was took my entire store. (laughs) But it wasn't just about that. It wasn't just about going, okay, we all know Morrison was a great pants man, but I'm actually going to go there. I'm going to get into bed rather literally with him. Um, I'd also read Inga Clendinin's quarterly essay, which charged novelist Kate Grenville with all manners of crimes against history for a secret river. And it did give me pause. I had to think a lot about what I was doing. My own university degree was in history, in Asian history. And I really have a great respect for history, and I hope at least a basic understanding of the discipline's demands. And yet I knew this story, which I was one I wanted to tell as a novel. Why? Because the relationship fascinated me, and we couldn't get enough out of the sources. Something in me loved the idea of Morrison, this man of strong views and strong intelligence, immense stature, considerable vanity, complexity and libido, meeting a woman who confounded him and almost matched him as much as she excited him. Just as he was irresistibly drawn to her, so I was drawn to the notion of this judgmental man, this competitive man, infatuated with a woman who openly flaunted the fact that not only did she have a sexual history, which at least rivaled his own, but that she was updating it nearly every night. He wasn't in the room. I was intrigued by the notion of a man wedded to the masculine ideals of the imperialist era, confronted by a young woman whose behavior directly challenged the old world order. Um, he was, I was transfixed by the fact that, that Morrison continued to pursue vigorously a woman who he readily confessed to his journals, inspired paroxysms of jealousy and frequently left him agonised. What an ass I am, he wrote, and what an infatuation it is. 
I was moved by the thought of a man who, feeling his youth and virility slip away under accumulation of ailments and complaints, discovering a passion that could leave him feeling, as, as he wrote in his own words, rejuvenated. Finally, where I was enticed by the challenge of telling the story of an affair between a most moralizing gentleman, for Morrison surely was that, and the young lady he called one of the most immoral he had ever met. And in the process, I wanted to paint a picture of China and Japan as perceived sensually, intellectually, and yet not always perspicaciously or sympathetically by the denizens of the floating world of foreigners in what was then known as the Extreme Orient. Both as a reader and a writer, I love fiction for its potential to reveal truths about human nature that are beyond fact, beyond theory, and thus I dare say, or dare I say, (laughs) beyond the practice of history itself. And if I felt anxious reading Clendinin, I feel even more nervous stating this here in the AU tonight. (laughs) In the end, I decided that I could and I would claim what (laughs) Inga Clendinin calls the Peter Carey defense. Clendinin, wary of Kate Grenville's claims to historical authenticity, gives Carey the nod for replying to questions about historical infelicities and flights of fantasies in his provocatively titled novel, True History of the Kelly Gang. He said, and I say, I made it up. (laughs) Thank you very much.